This morning we continue and actually wrap up the series we've been in for the last several weeks called Alerts. And we've been unpacking the fact that in our life, most of us have, in our, not only in our life, but in our hand, in our purse, in our pocket, a smartphone. And that throughout the day there are vibrations and buzzes and rings and sometimes some, some music that plays, different things that happen to let us know that something requires our attention. Sometimes it might be a text alert. Sometimes it might be a weather alert, a calendar alert, a missed call alert. The, these different alerts that come, and, and when these alerts come, in that moment, we have to decide what are we going to do about the alert. Are we going to respond to it immediately? Are we going to kind of try to glance at it and hope no one sees us not paying attention to what we're supposed to pay attention to so we can kind of see what's going on? Are we going to stop what we're doing because of that alert and respond immediately and quickly? We have to decide, what do we do with these prompts? All day long, these prompts come, these alerts come in our life. And you know, the truth is, the same thing is true spiritually. That through God's word and through his spirit, and even through our relationship with each other, that God is putting prompts in our life. There are alerts that are coming to our life day in and day out, moment by moment, and we've got to decide, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Or are we going to pay attention to the alerts that God has given us. And so we've been unpacking these, and today as we wrap up, I want to talk about an alert that's kind of unusual. And matter of fact, there's some of you in this room, you'll never get this alert on your phone because you don't have it set up. How do I know? Because I call you on your birthday, and sometimes I get the message that tells me that you have a voicemail box that has not yet been set up. I'm going to talk about voicemail this morning, the alert of voicemail. Now, I know some of us, like, we're like, man, that's so old school. Who, but, but let me just tell you that this show my age. I remember in the 1980s when voicemail was a big deal. Because, see, before that, if I wanted to talk to someone, I had to call. And if they didn't answer, I had to call again. And if they didn't answer, I had to call again. We, we didn't have the, the missed call alert on our phone. We, we didn't have text alerts then. And, and it was really cool. We got an answering machine at our house. And my brother and I, we thought it was the greatest thing. We had some music playing in the background, and we kind of did this whole, like, production to do our message machine, you know, message to let them know that we weren't there. <laughs> but we put all this into it, right? Had to get the stereo playing just right, and I had to say something, and Alex had to say something, and we had to identify who we were and tell them to leave a message after the tone. And we were like, man, this is awesome. This is so cool. Well, fast forward to now, and like I said, there's some of you that don't even have voicemail set up. In case some of you, us who do, think that those who don't are like, what is wrong with them? Just so you know, in 2000, make sure you get this year right, in 2014, the Coca-Cola company, the global company, disabled their internal voicemail. They said it was a waste of time. How about that? The year following, 2015, J.P. Morgan Chase, the huge banking giant, disabled their internal voicemail voicemail. Because here's what they said. They said, you know, we have text alerts and instant messaging that is much more quick. It's immediate. And then they said, we also have email, which is more efficient because you can file it and you can find it. And you can tag words and you can. And so they did away with voicemail. And I kind of get that. But at the same time, I got to tell you, there's something about voicemail that's still special. There's something about hearing someone's voice. Because even though we can text and we can type, and we can try to express our emotion, it just doesn't work. And I know some of you use caps all the time to emphasize. So I, I get that, right? The whole caps thing and exclamation points and emojis. But it's still not the same as a voice. It's still not the same. I, I think about how many times that we really could save time with a voicemail because if I'm giving an instruction or giving a response or giving some information, right, that in the tone, sometimes you know, okay, is this information kind of like FYI? Is this information like, okay, you really blew it? Is this information like, okay, I'm telling you this and you need to call and apologize to me? You, you can't tell that sometimes in a text or an email, or certainly if you just see missed call. You have no idea. But there's something about voicemail, hearing that person's voice. I'll embarrass Micah. He's not here today, so he can't do anything about it. But I actually have a voicemail on my phone from last week where Micah had started back school, and he left a voice message. I was somewhere. I, didn't, I couldn't get the phone. And he left a voice message and said, hey, Dad, this is Micah. I'm on my way to the golf course. Just wanted you to know I love you and Mom and Emily and miss you guys and things are going good. And I'm just, just anyway, Dad, I just want to tell you I love you. Bye. That's all it says. But you know what? I saved that voicemail because just hearing his voice. I wish I had saved voicemails from my dad 
Because even though I know some of them and we tell some stories about some, like he, my dad, I got to tell you this, my dad left a voicemail one time on Melissa's phone. Uh, he, he had been, had, this was, uh, he had some heart issues and so he was in the hospital and he was on some, some heart medicine and stuff and he was a little bit, little bit loopy. And um, so he, he's in the hospital and somehow, he wasn't supposed to have a cell phone, but he had a cell phone. And so he calls Melissa, leaves his message. He, he always watched the Weather Channel. And for some reason, he's watching the Weather Channel, and he kind of got kind of mixed up. There was a real bad storm system, like out in, you know, out in the, the, the northwest or somewhere. But in his mind, it was like going to happen in Tekoa. So he calls Melissa and says, hey, Melissa, this is Poppy. I need you to listen real closely. There's a very bad storm coming. You need to get the kids and get their football helmets and get in the bathtub right now. This is Poppy, okay? Do what Poppy says, okay? Okay, very serious storm. Get, get them in the, get, right now. Get in the bathtub with the, with the helmets on right now. This is Poppy. Poppy's telling you this, okay? It's, I've been watching the Weather Channel. Love y'all. Bye. We love that. We played it over. I wish we had saved that message. Because if you knew my dad, that was he always watched the Weather Channel. He'd say, man, did you hear about that wildfire? I'm like, what are you talking I mean, I'm thinking like it's up the road from him. No, it's over there in California somewhere. I think it's coming this way. You know, I mean, it's voicemail. There's something about it that connects us to that person. And this morning as we think about hearing God in our life, I want us to realize there are times that God prompts us and it's like it's his voice. But we've got to know his voice. Because we've all done it where we call someone and leave a message and we try to trick them, right? We try to sound like someone we're not. We, we, don't want, to, we want to disguise our voice. And so, and so the thing is, if you really know someone's voice, even when they disguise it, you know it's them. You know, like if, you, if someone calls and says, hey, uh, yes, I was just wanting to check and see if your refrigerator is running. And they're like, well, yeah, well, you better go catch it, huh? And you hang up. You know, that kind of, kind of corny stuff that we do, right? So, so you know their voice. Or in a crowd. I mean, in a crowd, kids can hear mama's voice probably more than dad sometimes, they, they, they can hear mama's voice like over all their friends playing and over all the noise. When mama says it's time to go, they're, man, they're, they're, getting their, they're, they're ready to go or they're hiding from her, one or the other, right? They know mama's voice. Well, church, I want us to know this morning that in all the opinion and all the noise and all the chaos and all the religion and all the voices that you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, if we've given our life to Christ and Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord, we need to know how to hear God's voice. We need to decide that there are times when God speaks to us by his word, God speaks to us by his spirit, and God even speaks to us through one another, that it is the voice of God that's speaking to us. So how do we know what that is? Well, John was dealing with the same issue. So in 1 John chapter 4, I want to look at the first six verses because in 1 John, John is dealing with the reality that even in the early church, there were those who were losing the ability to discern the voice of God. They were believing anyone who came in and said, hey, God told me something to tell you. Oh, what did he tell you? They were falling into this false teaching and they, they were struggling. And so the Apostle John gives us some insight into discerning the voice of God. How do you and I, in our everyday life, how do we know when God's speaking? How do we know that it's the voice of God and not just some distraction and not even just some dangerous false prophet? And so I want you to look with me starting in these first six verses, starting in verse 1. Of 1 John chapter 4, that's page 856, by the way. If you want to use the Bible right there in front of you, slide that blue Bible out, page 856. That Bible not only is a tool to use in the service, but if you don't have a Bible that you can read and understand, take that one home. Let that be our gift to you. We'd love for you to have that. And uh, God's Word's what changes lives. It's not our church. It's not our preaching. It's not our music. It's, it's the Word of God. The living Word of God is what changes lives. So again, 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. Here's what John writes. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and you have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever, God lis and wh and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. 
Now, he says a lot here, but I want to unpack this just statement by statement for you. And the first thing I want you to notice is that he's kind of drawn him in. He's, he's written already several things to him. He's talked about not loving the world. He's talked about if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Later on, the next chapter, he's going to talk about how we can have assurance of salvation, that, 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 that we can have the confidence that this was written so that we may know that we have eternal life. But he's kind of in, in the midpoint here, and so he wants to draw them back in. You know, if you've ever read a long letter from someone, even if it's a letter that you want to read and from someone that matters to you, sometimes you can kind of find yourself kind of go, okay, let me just get through this. Uh, you kind of, your mind's drifting and your t- eyes are getting tired. So notice what he does in verse 1. He says, dear friends. And some of your translations say, Beloved. In other words, he, he's reminding them this isn't just some, some information he's writing. This isn't just some kind of like, you know, hey, here, here's a bunch of stuff. I just got to tell somebody. He's saying, beloved, dear friends, he's talking about the relationship that they have together. He's drawing them in with a relationship, and he's really saying, dear friends, in other words, listen to me. I don't want you to miss this. It's not like when we say, bless your heart to someone, and we go, oh, well, tell me about it. Bless your heart, tell me about it. We're really going, you're an idiot, and I really don't care. He really means it, okay? He really means what he says. He says, I don't want you to miss this. He says, I want you to know that, that there are false teachers and false things of God and false voices out there, and I want you to be able to discern those. And notice what he says. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. Isn't that interesting? Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Again, he's addressing the reality that even in John's day, false prophets had gone out into the world. And by the way, that last phrase, gone out in the world, it's not like the idea, well, they just kind of went out there just to see what's going on. No, they went out as in going out for a purpose. It's almost the the idea could almost, some some scholars say that even that phrase could imply like a military precision. They've gone out like they've got their marching orders. And sometimes we want to think that Satan and that sin and the world that's against God, that somehow it's just chaotic and there's no order to it. No, listen, those who, who are warring against the truth of Christ, those who are warring against our life, those who want to tear down what God is building up, they're not disorganized, they're highly organized. They may want to bring confusion to us. They may want us to think, well, this is crazy, but they know exactly what they're doing. He says they've gone out. And and they're speaking all these false things. And what's interesting is John is writing throughout this whole book about these these false prophets who claim to to hear from God, and what they're hearing from God doesn't line up with what the apostles have taught. doesn't line up with who Jesus is. In other words, he says there are those who are coming, and, and they've gone out, into the world, and they're going to believers and saying, hey, I know you're into Jesus, and I know you're into God, but let me tell you something extra. I got something that that you don't know. I got something that the apostles didn't tell you. I've got an understanding that's so deep, and and no one else knows it, but, but I'm willing to tell you about it. And John says, you know what, this is a dangerous thing. It's dangerous because he says we've got to test every spirit. That word test there literally refers to determining whether something is genuine or not. Determining whether it's the real thing or not. The same thing that if, if you have a, a ring that you find, you go, well, I'm not just going to assume it's gold. Let me get it tested. I'm not going to assume it's platinum or silver. Let me get it tested. Or even better, when you have a diamond and you say, I'm not sure if this is a genuine diamond or not. I'm not sure if it's real or fake. Well, you can look at it. You put it under the light. and kind of. You can even look through a, a magnification tool to see. But sometimes the only way to know if it's genuine is to take a diamond tester and to press it down on it. And that diamond tester sends a, a, a signal through that diamond and only a genuine diamond will respond positively. So there's pressure put on it and a signal that goes through it. And through that, you can determine if the diamond is genuine or not. And so literally, John says, these spirits that come, these things that, that we go, I'm just not sure. He says, press down on it, push down on it, and see if it's real. Because, listen church, because some of what you'll hear, and some of what you'll be told, and some of what you'll be taught, and some of what you'll even think and feel, and some of what you even believe, is not of God. It'll be fake. It'll be false. So here's the first principle. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you hear. (laughs) Listen, there are more books on Amazon and more podcasts and more people on radio and TV and on the internet and on Facebook Live. All the listen, you can hear any kind of teaching, any time, any kind of preaching, any kind of motivation you want to find. And just because they're saying it, and just because they got a bunch of followers, or just because they've written some books, or just because they're a celebrity, or just because they're a politician, or just because they're a preacher 
doesn't mean that what they're saying is true. You with me? Hello? You with me? Doesn't mean don't believe everything that you hear. And church, can I tell you, that's been a struggle of the church since the beginning because because we've trusted Christ and because God spoke in our life, we want to give people the benefit of the doubt. We want to say, well, well maybe God has told them something out and told us. Maybe God has shown them something that's not in the Word of God. Maybe God has impressed on them something through the Spirit that the Spirit's not impressed on us. Well, the danger of that is that God will never say or do or impress anything that's contrary to what He's already told us about Himself. God's not schizophrenic. God doesn't change His mind. God doesn't get confused. Don't believe everything you hear. I tell my kids that, and by the way, it's true not only outside of the church, it's true in the church. In this pulpit, whoever's teaching, whether it's me or someone else, weigh what we say against the word of God. The authority is not the Baptist. The authority is not the pastor. The authority is not the deacons or trustees or denomination. The authority is not the hierarchy. The authority is not the pope. The authority is the word of God and only the word of God. Don't believe everything you hear. The church, for some reason, we believe it all. (laughs) We believe every song that has a great beat. We believe every sermon that gets us stirred up. We believe every preacher that's got a great smile and a pretty wife. We we believe everything. And John says, don't believe everything you hear. So we got a problem then. If he's saying, don't believe everything here, how do we know what to believe? (laughs) I mean, should we always go, I don't know about that cat. Man, I don't know what what he's saying. I never did. I don't know. I just don't know. I just don't have a good feeling. How do we know what he tells us in the next two verses, verses two and three? He tells us, how is it then? that we're to determine what to listen to and what not to listen to. How do we know if it's of God? He says in verse 2, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Check this out. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. See, John dealt with this, Paul dealt with this, Peter dealt with this. That anyone who says, hey, I'm all for God, but I'm just not sure about Jesus, that's a huge red flag. Our thoughts should not be, well, let me hear you out. Tell, tell me what you mean. It should be, ang, 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 wrong. You, you can't understand God and appreciate God and value God and worship God and follow God if you ignore Jesus. And you can't say, well, I'm into Jesus, but I'm just not sure about the Holy Spirit thing. Or I'm into the Holy Spirit, but I don't really care about what the Word of God says or what, or what Jesus says or, or what God says. You can't separate all of that. And notice again what he says here. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. And this is the test that every spirit acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come from God in the flesh is from God. Listen to me, church. More than ever, we live in a time When people want to say, hey, I'm fine with Jesus. Jesus is okay with me, but I also like some teachings over here in in Islam. I also like some teachings over here in the Mormon church. And and we want to take Jesus and add to it or say, well, Jesus is great, but, you know, I just have another way. I just see things different. If Jesus is good for you, good for you, but he's not good for me. It's not like that. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say, I'm the best way. He didn't say, I'm a better way. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. He said, I am the unique way to God. And notice that John's having already to deal with, there were those then who wanted to say that Jesus was not God in the flesh. They taught this. They wanted to say, well, Jesus looked like a man, but he really wasn't a man. He was a spirit that looked like a man, but he was not 100% man. Well, no, he was born of Mary. As a man. Then others said, well, he was a man, but he's not 100% God. Or he wasn't God at all. He was a great prophet, great teacher. God gave favor to him. The the, the Spirit of God fell on him. That's all great. But he wasn't really God. So do you see the two extremes? And the Word of God says, no, it's both and. He's 100% man, and he's 100% God. That's who Jesus is. To be anything less than that, he's not our Savior, not our Redeemer. To be anything more than that, he's not our Savior and Redeemer. Do you see it? He is the word, John 1 says, that became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, it's interesting that John's writing here, and there are those who would have been uh, both Jews and Greeks, and so there would have been those who who would have understood Hebrew, would have been more uh, familiar to them, and there's who would have understood Greek better. And in both those languages, the word Jesus has a similar form and similar meaning, meaning God saves, Jehovah saves. 
And then that word Christ is really interesting when he says here that Jesus Christ, verse 2, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. That word there, Christ, means anointed one. So what's the point? The point is this, that listen, the way we can know the voice of God is what does that voice say about Jesus? Because the true voice of God never brings confusion about Jesus. There's always clarity about Jesus. The true voice of God never says, well, Jesus is just okay. Don't get hung up on Jesus. Let's go beyond that. There's nothing beyond Jesus. There's nothing higher than Jesus. There's nothing deeper than Jesus. There's nothing more powerful than Jesus. There's nothing greater than Jesus. There is no other way but Jesus. It's only Jesus. And so the voice of God affirms Jesus. The voice of God acknowledges Jesus. The voice of God encourages us to understand that Jesus did for us on the cross what we can never do for ourselves, that he died for our sin and became our sin and was laid in a tomb and rose again. That whoever calls on his name will be saved. Only Jesus. So we're talking about this voicemail. How do we know if the voicemail is from God? Well, don't believe everything that you hear. But secondly, listen for the Jesus distinctive. Listen for the Jesus distinct. What do they say about Jesus? Because i got to tell you something, there's a lot of false religion and a lot of false teaching that even claims to be Christian that wants to play down Jesus, that wants to teach and never mention Jesus, that wants to talk about having a life that's changed and transformed and set free, but never talks about the cross. And can I help you here? Those voices that leave out Jesus are not voices from God. They're not speaking truth. They're false teachers. Because here's the truth. If Jesus is not God in the flesh, if Jesus was not God dying on the cross to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to take the weight and the penalty, the full brunt of sin, to be laid in a tomb and to rise again, if Jesus is not who the Scripture says he is, then why believe any of the Scripture? And even worse than that, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus is not who he said he was, if he didn't die on the cross and be buried and rise again, he says, then we are the most pitiful of all people. There's no hope. There's no life. There's no way. We're just stuck to try to sort it out and die in darkness and Spend eternity separated from God. See, we've got to listen for the Jesus distinctive. See, church, we we need to guard our hearts and our minds. There are a lot of voices out there. And some of them say some good things, but is what they're saying godly? Some of them say some powerful things, but is the power of what they're saying the power of God? Do you see it? Listen for the Jesus distinctive. What do they say about Jesus? What is it that that celebrity says about Jesus? What is it that that song says about Jesus? What is it that that politician says about Jesus? What is it that that book says about Jesus? What is it that that person's life says about Jesus? Listen for the Jesus distinctive. If there's nothing else my kids have have, have gathered, I hope that my son and my daughter, I hope that we as a church know that. There's going to be a lot of things we go, well, I'm not sure about this and this and this part. And and Paul says this, but then this over here, it says this. But but what about Jesus? Because Jesus is not just the lowest common denominator. Jesus is all that matters. (laughs) Jesus. Listen for the Jesus distinctive. In those voices, those opinions, those thoughts, Those messages, those talks, those songs, what does it say about Jesus? But then notice verse 4. Because John understood that if we say, okay, don't believe everything you hear, then I've got to be on the guard. But then if I've got to listen for the Jesus distinctive, there are some who when I say, wait a minute, I can't go along with you on that because you don't acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. You don't acknowledge that Jesus as God in the flesh and that he's God and he's man and he died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again. And yeah, I know you don't understand that and neither do I. That's the incredible reality of who God is. That's his awesome grace on display. That's his awesome mercy. That's how far out of his way. That's how reckless, ridiculous, how unbelievable, whatever word you want to use. That's what he did for us. But John knew if we say that, there are those who are going to say, you can't say that. You're so narrow-minded. You're right, because Jesus said it. (laughs) You're saying that you believe with all these world religions and all these people and and all these continents and all these languages and all these cultures that there's only one God and only one way to him. Yeah, absolutely. 
but, but, but what about this? Well, I, I don't know. Jesus. The Jesus. But listen, John knew if we lean into the Jesus distinctive and we don't believe everything we hear, he knows that the enemy will use that difference. Jesus know, he, or he knows that the enemy will use that, that, that distinction of Jesus, that discernment of the Spirit that actually can be turned against us and make us afraid. Because notice what he says. He talks about the fact there in those last couple of verses that we read. In verse 5, he says, They are from the world and speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. Why? Because they're saying what the world wants to hear. And we don't say what the world wants to hear when we talk about repentance, and we talk about grace, and we talk about mercy, and we talk about life change. So he knows that as the world presses into us and wants to squeeze us into its mold, that there are times that we'll be afraid. So he, he calls it out. He addresses it. First, he shows us, don't believe everything you hear. Secondly, listen for the Jesus distinctive. And then there's verse 4. Verse 4 tells, calls us and commands us to refuse to be afraid. Look at verse 4. You, dear children, are from God. And have overcome them. Who? The false teachers. Overcome them. Not just the false teachers, but even the false teaching. The fear of that. The confusion of that. You've overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. Now, did you catch what just happened in verse 4? In verse 1, he said, beloved, dear friends. Kind of of talking to the group, right? Y'all, what's up, y'all? Everybody listen now. (laughs) Then he gets here to verse 4, and he says, you. He uses a personal word. Goes from the group to the individual. To remind us that the, the Jesus distinctive is an individual personal followership. It's personally committing our life to Christ. But notice what he says. He says, you've overcome them. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Now, a lot of us in the room, we've heard that verse before, but we didn't realize it's in the context of standing up against false teaching and false prophets. It's not just this whole, man, greater is his. It's because of what we're having, the spiritual battle we're in. Paul wrote a lot about the spiritual battle, the warfare that never stops. That we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That we're wrestling against the reality of the Jesus distinctive. To not believe everything we hear. And that sometimes in not believing everything we hear and in leaning into the Jesus distinctive, that sometimes <laughs> it's lonely. And when we're alone and when there's confusion around us, and even though we have clarity, we still can be afraid. I love what he says. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Refuse to be afraid. Because here's the thing. Confusion leads to fear, and fear causes us to stop in our tracks. Can I tell you that so many of us in this room, our faith has been smothered out, it's been choked out, it's been pushed down by fear. It's not that we don't know we're afraid of what we know. It's not that we don't know what to do. We're afraid to do what we know we ought to do. Refuse to be afraid. I I want to unpack this because this is one of those verses that's so incredible, but sometimes we miss it. I want want to show you under that whole idea of refuse to be afraid, three simple things real quick that help us to know, okay, how is it that John can say refuse to be afraid? He just said there's false teachers. He just said these false prophets, the spirit of the Antichrist, it's gone out in the world. It's all had. Why are we not afraid? Shouldn't we be afraid? No, because I want to show you why. A couple of things. Notice, first of all, he says in verse 4, you are from God. You are from God. What this is implying, this is talking about our relationship with God. So that's the first thing. We can refuse to be afraid because we have a relationship with God. You are from God. He is our Father. That when Christ becomes our Savior, God is our Father. He is not only our Lord and our Redeemer and the Judge and the Holy One and the King, but He's Abba, Father. I mean, you talk about the ultimate trump card. You know, when you're little and somebody's picking on you, like, my dad's going to come over here and tell you to stop. Oh, yeah, well, my dad can beat up your dad. Well, who's going to argue and we say, my dad's God? Hello, my dad spoke the world into being. How do you like that? Bring your dad on over here. See, that's the confidence that John wants us to have. He wants us to have the confidence to know that because we belong to God, Not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Because our relationship with God, remember, was initiated and paid for in a way made by God himself. And then when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we enter in this relationship. And he says, you are of God, so don't be afraid. Is God ever afraid? No. So because we're of God and we have this relationship, there's no fear. The second thing he says, you are of God. Then he says, you have overcome them. Now sometimes we don't feel like we've overcome. We don't feel like we've won. 
We don't feel like we're making progress. We don't feel like things are going good, but they are. He says, you have overcome. So there's a relationship. Refuse to be afraid because of relationship. Refuse to be afraid because there's a result. There's a tangible result. You have overcome. Remember, there's an old song, new song used to do back in the day when they were kind of more southern gospel, and it says, I know how the story ends. <laughs> Jesus comes, and we win. It's good to know sometimes. Can you imagine the confidence our Stevens County Indians would have if they knew without a doubt that they were going to win? That even if they lost this game, if they knew they had a guaranteed spot in the playoffs, they knew that they were going to go to the playoffs and win the playoffs. Can you imagine? They wouldn't lose many games, even the games that maybe they could have lost and still win because they say, no, we, we have this confidence, we have this boldness, we have this clarity, we have this certainty. And church, can I tell you, we have the certainty of Christ's resurrection. We have the certainty of the triumph that he gives us because his resurrection and his victory is a shared victory. He gives it to us. So we refuse to be afraid because there's a result. We win. He says it right here. You have overcome. You are of God. There's a relationship. And because of that relationship, there's a result. You have overcome. And then notice he says, and greater is he that is in you. So this gives us the reason for the relationship. The reason even for the result is, the reason is he's greater. And by the way, not only is he greater than the false prophets, he's greater than our own confusion. He's greater than our own doubt. He's greater than our own struggles. He's greater than our own sin. He's greater than our own failures. Do you see? He is God. And we belong to him. And we have overcome because he is greater. Refuse to be afraid. We're talking about this voicemail of God. How do we know if God's speaking? Well, first of all, don't believe everything you hear. Listen for the Jesus distinctive. Refuse to be afraid. And then finally, verses 5 and 6... They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So he closes this section by helping us understand that, yes, don't believe everything you hear. Listen for the Jesus distinctive. Refuse to be afraid. And he says, and here's the thing, there is this pleasing voice, this pleasing sound, this, this chord, this harmony. And harmony is all these different notes that are all played at the same moment, and each of these distinct notes form a chord that sounds pleasing. And even if you're not musical, you know when something sounds good, and when you go, oh, I think they missed something there. I don't know what they missed, but it ain't right. And he says, you will know because the Spirit of God lives within you and because you belong to God the Father and because the victory is yours. He says, you will know the harmony. When the voice is of God, you'll know it's God's voice because God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit and the written Word of God will all hit together on different notes, but yet at the same time, that makes this beautiful chord. And so, in other words, we, we hear it and we know that it's God's voice. There have been times when I've answered the phone and maybe Melissa or Emily or Micah are outside, the wind's blowing, you can't quite hear them good, or maybe my, my reception, my signal's not really good. Or, or maybe I've, I, I'm trying to hear, but there's noise in the room, and even though I can't get but every few words, I know who it is, though. I know the uniqueness of their voice. I know their tone. I, I, I know you just you can close your eyes and listen. You can have your eyes open and listen. You can, you can have a million things going on and be distracted, but yet you know it's their voice. And John says, we'll have that same confidence. We'll know it's God's voice. Because the last principle I want you to write down is simply this. Embrace God's harmonies. Embrace God's harmonies. Father, Son, Spirit, and the Word of God. So in other words, if we test the Spirit, and, it's, and, and the Spirit says, hey, it, it kind of lines up with what I'm feeling in my spirit, and I don't really know of a conflict with, with the Father, but yet it's denying Jesus, then it's not of God. Or if it's lifting up Jesus, but yet saying, well, I know something about Jesus that hasn't been revealed in the Word, and I know something about Jesus that, the, that God the Father didn't tell you, and I know something about Jesus that the Spirit of God, He's not even on, in on this yet, but He will be eventually, but I'm going to tell you first, it's not of God. That all of those pieces of the chord, all of those notes of the chord, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the written Word, that all four of those pieces, all of that chord is struck at the same time, and that's how we know it's the voice of God. 
See, it's awesome that John writes these beautiful words to help us know that we don't have to think, well, I have no idea what God sounds like. I have no idea what the voice of God sounds like or, or what it feels like or what the tone of it is or what the texture of it. He says, no, I want to show you. And in these six verses, he helps us begin to, to understand the voice of God. Because the fact is, God has left us a voice message by his written word, by his son, by his grace himself, his mercy, and by the resurrection of Jesus. And he wants us to know him. Not just to know about him and, and not just to hear other people talk about what he's done in their life, but to know that he has a purpose and a will and a plan for my life, yes, for other people's life, yes, but even for your life. So if you've never trusted him as Savior and Lord, why not today? Why not listen to what the God, God the Father says about God the Son, confirmed by God the Spirit that lines up with the Word of God, and know that is the voice of God speaking into your heart? saying that you need to confess your sin, agree with God about what he already knows, knowing that Jesus died on the cross not for his sin but for my sin, for your sin, and he was laid in the tomb and he rose again, that whoever calls on his name will be saved. Why not today? Why not respond to that prompt, that alert today? There's some of us here, you know Christ as Lord and Savior, but you've never been baptized by immersion after you've trusted Christ. That's the uniform, that's the wedding ring of being a follower of Jesus, just like Reagan, little Reagan Tom, Thomas was baptized this morning. We'll be baptizing Wednesday night. We've got one scheduled. So listen, it's not about being a Baptist. It's not about joining the church. It's about being obedient to God's word and God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit. We'd love to talk with you about that. Maybe you just want to come and spend a few moments at this altar in just a moment to say, Lord, you know what? I have been afraid. And fear has strangled out my faith at times. I have listened to too many voices and I've ignored the Jesus distinctive. And Lord, I want to just lean in and trust you right now to meet you in a fresh way so that when I leave this place, I'll, I'll know your voice.